Hi, I'm Dan Rockmore, Chair of the Department of Mathematics here at Dartmouth and uh, also Director of the William H. Newcomb Institute for Computational Science. Um, and on behalf of the college and the Newcomb Institute, I'd like to welcome you to this year's Fall Donahoe Colloquium. Music, computing, people, an emerging dimension for engaging one another creatively, expressively, and socially to be delivered by Professor Gu Wang of Stanford University. The Donahoe Colloquium is an ongoing series of public lectures aimed at increasing awareness of the many important and sometimes surprising places in which computational ideas are relevant. These lectures are made possible by a generous gift from David, Mickey, and Dan Donahoe in honor of Dan's graduation as a member of the class of 2006. The Donahoe Colloquium is a central piece of the larger mission of the Newcomb Institute, whose aim is to support and integrate computational thinking and computational ideas throughout Dartmouth. In particular, as we find ourselves in the early stages of the Year of the Arts here at Dartmouth, it seems especially appropriate to use the Donahoe Colloquium to showcase some of the ways in which computation has been used to transform the process and products of artistic creation. This is especially true in the acoustic arts, where a long line of computational achievements have combined with the creative spirit of modern composers to give us today's amazing world of digital music, instruments, and software. These range from the early mathematical discoveries of Pythagoras that link harmony with rational numbers to technologies like analog to digital converters and algorithmic advances such as the fast Fourier transform. As computer music pioneer Max Matthews presciently said in the early 1960s, we have made sound and music directly from numbers. The musical universe is now circumscribed only by man's perceptions and creativity. Today's Donahoe lecturer, Professor Gu Wang, widely known as a co-founder and the creative force behind the mobile music making company Smule, is among the most innovative of those using computational ideas and technologies to push the boundaries of our musical universe. Gu's body of work includes the authorship of hugely popular music making mobile apps such as Ocarina, which generated over half a million downloads soon after its release in 2008. For those of you yet to experience Ocarina, I'd like to give you a brief sample. So to put, this in, to put this kind of simple to use music making environment in context, it's worth comparing it with the first piece of synthesized computer music, Silver Scales, created by Max Matthews in 1957 at Bell Labs on what was a room sized IBM 704. So there it is. And uh, here for comparison it's, is Silver Scales. <laughs> say we've come a long way. Um, the accessible and beautiful design of Ocarina and others of Guy's creations have made it possible for anyone to join a new generation of digital troubadours making music on their modern handheld devices, either alone or together, even when separated by thousands of miles. With innovations like these, Gu and other acoustic pioneers continue to reveal the transformative possibilities artistic and social inherit in the hybridization of the arts with modern computing. This is but the most recent chapter in an ongoing story in which Dartmouth has played a significant part on many occasions. Notably in the late 1970s when, 
there we go. Dartmouth music professor and founding faculty member of Dartmouth's Bregman Studio, John Appleton, teamed with Thayer professor Sidney Alonzo and Thayer student Cameron Jones to build the first commercial portable digital synthesizer, the Synclavier, which was then produced and sold by the New England Digital Corporation just across the river in Norwich, Vermont. Enabled by a gift from Gerald Bregman, class of 54, the Bregman Studio was among the earliest computer music centers and it continues to be well known for its creative environment and innovative faculty, which in 2006 included today's speaker. Professor Wang received his doctorate in computer science from Princeton University for his development of the well-known audio programming language, Chuck. He has taught at Princeton and Dartmouth and since 2007 has been an assistant professor at Karma, the Center for Computer Research in Music and Acoustics at Stanford University, where he is also the co-founder and director of the Stanford Mobile Phone Orchestra, as well as the founding director of the Stanford Laptop Orchestra. In addition, Gu continues his work at Smule, where he is chief creative officer and CTO. His work has already been recognized by numerous honors, including being named as one of Creativity Magazine's Creativity 50 in 2009 and 2010. He was also a winner of an App Nation Pioneer Award in 2010. We look forward to his sharing his thoughts and ideas with us here today. Please join me in welcoming our fall 2012 Donahoe Colloquium speaker, Professor Gu Wang. All right, uh, I guess first of all, thank you, Dan, and thanks to the Newcomb Institute for having me. It's a great honor to be here, and it's just wonderful to be back and hang out with uh, some really good friends I made when I, when I taught here in 2006, and also to make some new friends. So uh, overall, it's, it's awesome to be here. And uh, maybe, um, maybe good to kind of start kind of at the beginning, probably even more than you actually may want. Uh, probably earlier than you may actually want, and that's going back kind of far. Uh, so I grew up in Beijing, uh, and uh, with my grandparents, I was with the generation of of, of kids that uh, that kind of, for one reason or another, kind of was taken care of and, and raised in the early age by grandparents, and they're my two grandparents. And uh, this is for me, I guess, significant because they say, well, Chinese grandparents tend to spoil kids more than parents, maybe that's a universal across cultures. Um, but I think both my grandparents and parents um, were really supportive of, well, of my interest in general. They didn't really have anything particular in mind. They just said, they just kind of, they only pushed me to try to figure out what is it that I like doing. And uh, one of the attempts was getting me an accordion at, at age seven, which is actually my first instrument. And I, and I played that um, for a, a, you know, a few years, and there was actually this hotshot accordion teacher that rolled into town in two, in, uh, back when I was seven and set up shop and said, you know, parents and grandparents, your children need to learn the accordion. And so I remember sitting in a room full of um, about, you know, 35 to nine-year-old, all with an accordion playing in unison. And uh, <laughs> accordion's interesting. It's one of those instruments that one is, it's not easy to play softly on it necessarily. Um, in fact, dynamics may not, was not one of the attributes of the particular accordion I have, control over that. And, uh, and two, it doesn't necessarily improve when you increase the number of people playing in a room together in unison. Um, but my grandfather helped me carry this on a cart every week to the lesson, and I'll never, for, and I'll never forget that. Um, fast forwarding a bit, um, and at age of nine, I came to the U.S., uh, lived with my parents in Atlanta, where my dad was getting his, his PhD in operations research. Um, and later we moved to the Midwest, to St. Joseph, Missouri. And, uh, and at age 13, something in retrospect really strange happened. My parents, for no reason that I could dis, you know, recall or discern, decided to give me an electric guitar for my 13th birthday. I did not ask for this, but they said, we're getting you an electric guitar. And in retrospect, this was a really bold move by a parent. It's like, um, why arm your kids with the very instrument of rebellion? You know, it's, I wish, I guess like they could have gotten me a you know, drum set, which would probably have been worse for them. Um, but uh, I guess another way, I guess it's kind of smart, I guess by, you know, by sanctioning rebellion, 
by giving them the very instrument, you've kind of squashed it because it's just not that fun anymore. So I just stuck to actually learning the guitar and I had a great time and I still play the guitar to this day. And, uh, and, and actually, um, it, was, it was great starting out on the guitar. I think it's the first instrument, it's, it's not my first instrument, but it's the first instrument that I really got into. And it's around that age where I think you, just so many things, it's so easy for so many things to make an impression. And uh, I think when I got the guitar, I think I just wanted to rock because, you know, the first song I asked my guitar teacher to teach me, which is Metallica's Enter Sandman. Um, and I played a lot of heavy metal for, for some years. Uh, we didn't have a lot of money, so um, I, I got a, this, this Ibanez Sound Tank distortion pedal. Did not have an amplifier because, uh, well, I didn't have a lot of money. And, well, my dad was nice enough to convert our stereo into our amplifier by adding a quarter inch jack to the back. And so I could plug my guitar into the distortion pedal and the pedal into our stereo. And that's how I rocked for you know, a few years until I saved enough money to get an amp. But that was enough to rock. And, uh, and, and uh, I, you know, I look back and I really want to thank my parents and grandparents for giving me, like, uh, you know, I guess, really asking me to explore the interests. Because you know, to this day, I really don't know what exactly it is that I'm doing. Um, except I can say I really like what I'm doing. I just don't know exactly what that is. And I know it has to do with music. And that's pretty much what I do know. Um, and, uh, and this is where I currently work. Um, and in between you know, the last picture and this one, you know, a lot of things happen. I went to undergrad at Duke. Uh, studied computer science. Also, I, um, I took at the time the only computer music course that Duke had to offer, which was offered by the wonderful Scott Lindroth. Um, and it was offered once every, you know, every other year. So um, thinking about that, I feel like places like Dartmouth and Stanford, we're, we're very, we're kind of having an embarrassment of riches and where there's this, this, this wonderful number of courses, faculty resources, fellow peers with which you can explore this wonderful world of computer music. Um, but just like, I guess, having a stereo as your guitar amp, the one course is also kind of enough to, to rock out in computer music. Um, in that course, I, you know, I decided that I, I want to go to grad school in, in computer, something to do with music. Um, so I went to, went to Princeton, and actually one of the first things I did getting to Princeton as a, uh, as a grad student was to come to Dartmouth. And this is before I came here to, to, uh, to teach for the semester. This is for a symposium on computer music programming languages. And uh, it's kind of interesting that five years later I've been writing a dissertation on a computer music programming language um, that may or may not have had, well, it had a lot to do with it. And there I met you know, John. Um, Actually, I, I slept in your guest bedroom, and uh, that was very nice of you to host all of us and met Max Matthews and uh, um, Gareth Loy, and that's the only time I met Barry Verko, and it was just, I was full of memories. And uh, it certainly got me started on thinking about computers, but also kind of what, really what you can do with it. At the end of the day, technology is really central to everything we do, but I think it's, it's kind of what we do with it that at the end of the day really matters. Um, so I guess one of the things I really liked doing in undergrad was just making things. I've always liked doing that. And one of the ways I found to do that was through computation, through programming, through this wonderful world of computing. Um, and I guess coming here to the symposium made me really feel that, well, geez, there's a, it's not such a ridiculous thing to think about a computer music programming language. In fact, there are a lot of really interesting, smart, wonderful people that have, been, that have come before me in doing this. So when I you know, decided to make a new programming language, um, it seemed like, well, I'm going to go for it. Um, and I'll come back to Chuck in a bit. Uh, this is, uh, and, and fast forwarding now to, to Karma, and oh yeah, and I should mention that this, right before coming to Karma in 2007, that's when I did the, uh, I think the, the most epic commute of my life, which was 
for a whole semester, I was teaching as a grad student at, uh, at Princeton and also I was teaching one of the seminars here. And I'll always thank John and Larry for inviting me to do that. Um, but I taught at Princeton on Thursday and I taught one Monday and Wednesday here at Hall Garden. Um, so every Sunday I would pack up and uh, drive from Princeton, New Jersey to here. And I would get in around 3 a.m. and then I would like pass out. I would wake up and I would usually freak out and think about, oh my God, do I really know what I'm going to talk about in the seminar? And I, you know, um, and then after I teach on Wednesday, I would then, actually, I, I usually sometimes go eat at the Jewel of India, which is right behind Hall Garden. And then I drive on back to Princeton. And the next day I'd be teaching the laptop orchestra. Um, that was, that was a super, wonderful experience um, for many reasons. And um, one, I think actually, in retrospect, teaching the class on digital signal processing, that was, I think, when I learned the most about digital signal processing. And, uh, and I'm, I've, I've studied it before, but have nothing like having to teach it for the first time. And uh, since then, I'm actually still teaching it. Um, so, and, uh, and this is where I'm doing it, I guess. Uh, this is Stanford University Center for Computer Research and Music and Acoustics, this nexus of uh, electrical engineering, signal processing, music cognition, computer science, and uh, a lot of other disciplines, all in the service of music and people. And I think it's this intersection of technology, people, creativity, and especially all music. Um, I think that's kind of this common thread, I guess, I've been finding. In, in my life, and uh, I, I really don't know what I'm doing, to be honest, but uh, apparently the New York Times thinks this is what I'm trying to do, which is apparently getting a lot of random people to play instruments out on the street together. Um, and in a way, this is, yeah, this is kind of cool. That's, 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 that, that is kind of what I'm trying to do, except maybe, you know, these traditional instruments perhaps are difficult for one reason or another. Um, at least for people to get started or to, or to even have access to. Um, and perhaps I've been looking for ways to do it uh, with, through other means, namely with computers and maybe mobile devices. Um, but, uh, well, I'm going to jump back in time once again. This, this is kind of a, at least until this talk stabilizes, it's going to be a little bit of a time travel. So. Supposing, for instance, that the fundamental relations of pitch sound, the signs of harmony, and of musical composition were susceptible of such expression and adaptation, the engine might compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music of any degree of complexity or extent. I think some of you will recognize this quote. And for those of you who have not seen this before, um, if you'd like to take a, if you care to guess as to when and who might have said this. Well, maybe you guys all have seen this before, but Ada Lovelace, 1843. Ada, commonly thought of as perhaps the world's very first programmer, she uh, theorized a lot about what computers were, and, and, uh, and she worked with Charles Babbage on the analytical engine, which probably, in, in a sense, you know, it's, it's, it had constructs that really makes computers what they are, had looping and decision. And uh, even though the, the analog engine was never built, um, well, essentially she said, might we not make music um, with computers? But it wasn't until you know, 100 years later or so that in dance opening that computers actually started making sound. Um, and, but once they started making sound, you know, it, it was you know, kind of definitely the beginning of a new era where Suddenly, we felt like, ah, here is another technology for music. But perhaps unlike other technologies come before it, this technology is very general purpose. With it, we might make sounds that are yet unimagined. Um, we can craft the timbre of, of the sounds that we make. We can also create fantastical automations with these, these computers. Um, and of course, this is an IBM 360, and uh, it, you know, you compare this and also the image and dance opening of, of the mainframe computer with kind of you know the computers we kind of think of now, 
ones that we can put in our pockets, in our hands. Um, and then, you know, this is actually the symbol for Chuck. And this is, this is a programming language that worked on, you know, OS Princeton, ended up being my dissertation. And in a sense, it was made because of the advancement of computing. Because, heck, Chuck is like really, I, like, I think Chuck is probably the slowest, least efficient ling program, uh, programming language for computer music ever made. And it's, it's flexible, but it's not efficient. Um, but computers are getting so fast, we're like, uh, well, we're not going to worry about it. Let's just focus on what this language does. And, um, and so that's one of the things I worked on. I'm going to give you a quick demo of Chuck here. And uh, whether you write code or not, I hope this will give you a sense of what, what Chuck is like. So um, what I'm going to do here, and can everyone see that, make that even bigger? I'm going to create a sign oscillator, call it foo. I'm going to use the symbol, which is the Chuck operator, and Chuck it to the DAC. Um, which is an abstraction for the uh, digital analog converter, which is just a way of, say, connect that to the output so it can be heard. This is a valid Chuck program. You can try to run it. And it's a correct program, but it doesn't actually make any sound. That's because Chuck is a, what we call kind of a strongly timed language in which you have to interact with time in order for sound to happen. So what I want to do here is just to say, two second Chuck to now which is Chuck's way of saying, hey, let's wait around for two seconds and let things happen. So if I do this, we'd hear that for two seconds. And um, you can set the frequency explicitly if you like. So it's actually the same frequency. And what I'm going to do now is going to, I'm just going to copy and paste this and double the frequency every time, which is going to go up in octaves. I'm going to change the amount of time here to half second, half second, one second. And if we were to play this, we should get that. So now we've created a sequence. And, uh, and of course, you can imagine creating you know, pieces of, of music in this very straight line fashion. But one of the things computers is really good at doing um, is repeating stuff tirelessly, precisely. So I'm going to put this into a loop. Make it a little smaller so you can see it all. That's going to keep going. I'm, I can't really empirically prove that to you. Um, <laughs> but trust me, when I, and also you don't have to indent, but indenting is just a good habit. So I do it. Um, let's go ahead and not hard code this guy, but uh, let's change this into a random number generator between uh, and generate a number from a uniform distribution between 30 and 1,000. Set that as the frequency of the sine wave. And uh, okay, so now we can ask for this time. Set a half a second. Let's do 200. Let's do 100 milliseconds. we get to this point where I think of, you know, that, to me, it will always be the canonical computer music. <laughs> this is the sound that growing up, we were taught from sci-fi movies that, you know, mainframe computers, when they're thinking really hard, it sounds like this. Okay, but let's keep going. Um, so that was changing the frequency randomly every um, 100 milliseconds. If we were to change the time scale again, and do this randomization every 10 milliseconds, what does that sound like? I think that's the computer's version going and then, uh, and then if we keep going, one millisecond. It sounds like this crunchy carpet of a sound. And now there's a couple of interesting things here of note. And um, one is that we actually crossed a very interesting threshold, and that's a perceptual threshold. We, you know, between 100 and 10 milliseconds, we kind of, it's already blurring of the boundaries of when these things were happening. And we stop hearing individual events, and we start hearing more of a singular 
consistent carpet of sediment. And indeed, somewhere in there is, you know, about, is the very important number of around 30 hertz or so. And that's when, you know, we stop perceiving individual events. And beyond that, um, we start perceiving kind of a continuum. And, um, you know, in Chuck, you can actually abuse this even more. So you can say, well, every digital sample, I'm going to keep the phase where it is, but I'm going to randomize how fast, basically how, how fast the phaser is turning or actually randomizing the frequency every digital sample, of which there are, in this case, 44,100 every second. Um, and if we were to do this, you get kind of another signal. which is that, which actually you can think of as having two components. One, you hear this kind of hissy, noisy component. The other is that whistle. And that whistle turns out to be the frequency, which is really the average, the bounds of this, this uh, uniform distribution we're randomly drawing from. That's pretty interesting, if even it's just to hear what, you know, what that's like. Um, and this is the kind of thing that Chuck allows you you know, to do to try out is to actually be very precise about time and to really zoom into time and to control things at really any rate you want. And if you want, you can even go subsample rate. Um, but we can go in the other direction, right? Uh, so this is one duration of a sample. We saw there was a millisecond. There's like a, you know, we saw the minute. You can do that. You can do that. Now, this is a very slowly evolving, you know, sound. Um, there's a week. We kind of stop at week because months are kind of tricky because not all months are of the same length. So that was a very practical concern in designing this aspect of the language. Some people have suggested a fortnight is a, would be another con not changing duration of, uh, of time where we have to add that. And the idea is that you can really unify um, kind of talking about time. Um, in working with time in kind of this one system. And that's, that's kind of one aspect of Chuck, and this is why we call it kind of a strongly timed language. It's, um, I guess it's, it's, it's kind of a joke based off of the strongly typed languages, but as I feel like at least half the things I do are based off of things that started as a joke or a bad bet. Um, so that's one of them. I'll show you another aspect of Chuck. Um, and, uh, and this is one where we're still going to use a sine wave, even though you can do a, a lot of other things other than sine waves. Or one might say that if you have sine waves, you can do everything, which is true in some sense. Um, but in this case, just sticking with one sine wave. And what I'm going to do here, I already have this program kind of constructed here. Um, we're basically going to connect it to the output, set the gain here. We have an array of pitch classes that we're going to draw from. Right now, there's just one value in there. We're going to draw randomly from this bag of numbers and, uh, and basically offset that into a pitch register. And, uh, and then we're going to do so every 200 milliseconds. Now, if we were to play this, it sounds like that. Uh, what I'm going to do now is actually just to change this program as it's running and basically replace the existing version with a new version. And doing this as a way to essentially experiment with, uh, with stuff. So here, there's, we just hear this because we only have one element here. And, but we randomize the register here. And every time you see an equal sign like that, I'm actually replacing the existing code with this new version of the code. OK, so there's that. If we're to say 3, let's go ahead and add a second to that. design is one way you could work with Chuck, which is in a way very rapid prototyping by giving you a tool with which you can either use that to sculpt and zoom in into a particular sound, a particular passage of music, or a particular in interaction 
when you connect, for example, for example, a controller to Chuck to make sounds. So uh, that's that's a, just a quick demo about Chuck. Chuck is open source; it's freely available, and I always tell people it will crash equally well on all major operating systems. So. Um, if you're interested, I definitely encourage you to give it a try. So that's, that's a little bit about Chuck. Um, now, when I was at Princeton, I was also very fortunate to be involved with a thing called the Laptop Orchestra. Um, my advisor, Perry Cook, and uh, music professor, Dan Truman, um, they've been working with musical performances and with different ways to project the sound in computer music performance. And in 2005, they started the Princeton Laptop Orchestra, also Plork. And um, I was very fortunate to, to be among, you know, the, with Perry and Dan and Scott Smallwood. Um, you know, we got to figure out what the heck a laptop orchestra actually could, might be, one, one way in which it could be, and also how to teach the thing as a class and how to st start writing pieces for it. And, uh, and this is the Princeton Laptop Orchestra, actually. That's Zakir Hussein in the middle, flanked by So Percussion. And um, it's people, it's laptops, it's these hemispherical speaker arrays um, that's local to each performer and each computer. And it's a lot of, it's a lot of those. Um, when I started at Stanford, um, I brought the idea to, I guess, to Stanford, and we started the Stanford Laptop Works, of course, we were kind of lazy with the name, just called it Slork. So there's Plork on the Princeton, there's Slork at Stanford. Um, and here is us doing one last SVN update before we go to perform in the Sculpture Garden where there's no wireless connection. Um, and we also have, you know, this is one aspect of this type of laptop orchestra is that this focus on individualized sound. Um, this, these are speaker arrays for the Stanford Laptop Orchestra. Um, we actually built these out of IKEA salad bowls. Um, and the idea is really to have the sound come from near the instrumentalist, the person or the computer, the performer. Um, just like if you were to play in a traditional acoustic instrument, like say a violin or a cello, um, the sound doesn't actually go through you know, a mixing console and, in, and out of PA system. It comes from the artifact itself. And along with that is a certain opportunity to explore kind of what it means to be so sonically intimate. And this is why, you know, it's, it's, it's a concept that's been used for longest time in things like chamber music performance, where there's a, such an intimate sense of the sound of the music of the performance. And the laptop orchestra in this configuration is, is meant to explore that paired with kind of what's possible now with a with, with computer. Um, I'm going to give you a quick uh, rundown of how we built the speakers because it's kind of it was kind of fun and that was what happened spring break of 2008 and uh, a lot of people kind of went into this uh, this is an 11 inch Blanda mat that's what it's called if you want to get that at IKEA um, first step is to turn it upside down you drill six holes in this and in our case it's one of six channels and we lovingly routed the bottom base plate which we carved out of these giant boards we got from uh, Ace Hardware. Um, and then we got you know, six speakers. These are four inch drivers. Uh, they're meant as kind of car speaker drivers. Um, and as well as these uh, fairly efficient um, T amps. Um, these amplifiers that are pretty low power and actually can, uh, actually sounds pretty good. And uh, it's fairly inexpensive. We of course have to make 20 of everything. Um, and this is the, the old Max Lab at Karma. And we're, uh, you know, this, these are the brave people that, that were designing and prototyping and eventually building the speaker array. And to this, we add, you know, laptop and audio interface so we can get both pristine good audio as well as multi channel. Um, we sit on mats and pillows. These actually were mail ordered from New Hampshire in this place that sells Zebuton mats and pillows. We we're very happy with those. This, also, this is a, it's hard to see, but that's a breakfast tray from Ikea in which we put laptops. A lot of things come from Ikea in this ensemble. They really should give us a sponsorship. If Ikea happens to be here, be watching this, hint, hint. Um, here is a, um, power, which we daisy chain. Um, 
we a lot of our pieces are wire are actually networked, so we have wireless routers, sometimes wired. Um, power conditioning to make sure the power is nice and smooth. And to it, we connect sometimes various kind of musical interfaces, uh, as well as gaming interfaces. Um, so to give you an idea of what the laptop orchestra looks and sounds like, I'm just going to play a few excerpts. Hemispherical speaker rules, but we also have this other game track controller, which is kind of hard to see, but everyone's wearing this glove that's tethered to a base at the bottom. And the gloves basically is moving their hands, tracking the locations of their two hands in real time. So it's basically like a 3D position tracker. It used to be this uh, this golfing gaming controller that completely failed and tanked uh, its commercial product. And um, you know, I guess one man's like failed commercial product for gaming is a computer musicians, you know, paradise sometimes, and we got like a hundred of these. Uh, here's something that uses the remote. Uh, it's another piece by uh, students in the course. Uh, this piece is called Monk We See, Monk We Do. It's a piece about chanting, imitation, using a remote. There's this horrendously brilliant three-way pun, Monk We See, Monk We Do. Um, Here's a piece that I like for many reasons. Uh, one is just for this very simple name, this very unpretentious name, it's called the Barrel. Um, and this is created by Mike Rotondo, and the crew Mike is actually standing on top of a uh, steel drum. And around the edges are actually attached eight of these game track controllers. And these players around him are actually playing this like, eight person. Track has been a really fun thing to work with just because it offers a lot of flexibility. But certainly, it's not the only thing we use. Uh, move forward a bit. Uh, this is a piece that uh, PhD student Juno and myself did called Converge. And what we did, this piece was actually collect hundreds of images, sound, location, and text data through mobile devices. And essentially, we have a very visual and sonic blend during the performance, it's spatialized through the orchestra. Controlling graphics and, and processing the sound in real time. These are all sounds that were recorded on phones. Um, and um, it's a piece that kind of explores just memory and place and time and just.
actually part of the orchestra is actually not present on stage. They're located hundreds of miles away in other locations. And as they're playing their particular instruments in their studios or homes or classrooms, it's actually coming over here and being processed by the ensemble. So this is actually a networked, real-time networked audio piece. And another network piece is uh, eventually would evolve into a piece called uh, Tweet Dreams. As in tweet dreams are made of these. But uh, in this case, we're you know, using Twitter to actually uh, actually sonify kind of various Twitter tags related to the concert or the music. And it's actually a chance for the audience to participate in real time. Um, this is an instrument called intervallus. of uh, the Laptop Orchestra, and uh, right to date, between Princeton, Stanford, and actually now many other Laptop Orchestras that have, have you know, just happened, um, well over probably two or 300 pieces have been created and performed. Um, and I think working through this medium of the Laptop Orchestra is really informative um, when now, like eventually, like I know this, like creating interfaces for something like mobile phone. This this was an adventure in turning commodity computers into musically expressive things, and uh, and having done that, I'd, I'd say is just well, it was a lot of fun and uh, certainly informed how we actually think about doing this sort of thing on mobile. Um, but before I go there, there's always you know kind of an interesting question which I. I don't think I'll try to answer so much as just put out there is that what at the end of the day is an instrument? You know, you look at a laptop, you looked at an instrument in the laptop orchestra, you know, when, when does it become an instrument? Um, you know, people might look at a 1715 Stradivarius violin and say, well, that's an instrument. Well, in my hands, it's not an instrument. In someone whose hands can play it, that's an, that's an instrument. That's a, Gorgeous, beautiful instrument. Um, and the other side, you can look at you know, a tin can and some, and some sticks and say, that's not really an instrument. But in the right hands, that can be 
used very expressively and very musically. Um, so at least to me, it seemed like not everything is necessarily an instrument or not an instrument out of the box. It's kind of what you do with it. And maybe these guys, these mobile phones, aren't that, aren't that different in that regard. Out of the box, I think that's, they're just what they are, a piece of hardware. Um, and so we, I think in a bout of insanity, and it's only, the only way I can describe Smule having been started, you know, Smule was founded in 2008. <coughs> And um, I like to tell people that, well, I would, for people that, you know, sometimes say, you know, when I'm thinking about starting a company, should I start a company? What should I do? Um, I usually say, like, well, in my experience, no one in their right mind should ever start a company. Um, unless there's something that you've got to do, you've got to find out, got to try that you know, you can't afford not to do. And to me, I feel like that's probably the only good reason for starting a company, because otherwise it's, there's, I guess, uh, this is just my opinion, but I feel like starting a company should not be a goal. It's, it's a vehicle for doing something. And that's, at least to me, what Smule is meant to be, is that as a researcher, it seemed like, dang, you know, these, these mobile devices are getting really powerful. Um, worked with, working with a mobile phone orchestra at Stanford in late 2007, they were using Nokia N95 smartphones back then. It was just like, wow, these are as powerful as computers were, you know, maybe eight, ten years ago. They got a lot of sensors, and more than that, these guys are super personal. They're more personal than what we think of as a PC it's because we have such an attachment of identity to these guys. It's like it's my phone, it's my phone number. You text this, you call this to reach me. It's also very Portable. That's part of the mobile aspect, I suppose. And to the point where it's, for better or for worse, feels like a natural extension of ourselves. Um, so it's, uh, it's kind of with this in mind that Smule was started. And one of the first things we did was, was Ocarina. And uh, maybe I'll just play you a little ditty here. So the, the design of Ocarina was meant to be something that, well, it was a question of like, how can we best take advantage of everything that's on an iPhone? Um, it was kind of this backwards design process that took place. You know, it felt, it didn't really feel right. Um, and by the way, when I'm talking really loud, the Ocarina picks it up. Ah! Okay. So um, it didn't feel quite right to just take an instrument and then try to squish it and try to force it into anything, really, and including a mobile phone. And instead, I, th I think we try to ask the question, you know, hey, what is, what is this really potentially good for? What fits this profile? And, um, and I, I remember actually being in Rome when I was a teenager with my parents and buying an ocarina off of a street vendor and annoying my parents with it for several days before it mysteriously disappeared. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and if you think about an ocarina and, and the iPhone, there, there's some similarities. One is this, just the form factor. It's about, about the right size. And the other part is that there's a certain simplicity to it. Ocarina is, eh, I mean, anything could be difficult, is difficult to master. But to start as an instrument, ocarina is among the simplest instruments. It's like a recorder. Um, in that regard, you, you can... You know, you can start playing something very fast, and that seemed to fit the profile here as well. So, and then looking at the sensors on this thing, there's, there's multi-touch on the screen. There's a microphone. It's a phone, after all. Um, and um, and there's an accelerometer. So, so that's how we actually map this, and we map vibrato to the accelerometer. So. That's initially how Ocarina started, and um, let's see, I'll, I'll play a little ditty here. I'm actually going to play this on the newer Ocarina 2, which actually has like prompts to tell you which notes or how to do the fingering for the next notes. 
um, that you can kind of embellish off of that if you want. So this is a this is the Legend of Zelda theme song, which I always play because when we're first making the ocarina, there's another part to this, which is man, is anyone going to know what the heck an ocarina is? When you make an app, you know, you kind of and you make an app for like a lot of people, potentially, you're like thinking, you kind of want them to know about it and want to download it. So uh, what I did was to go on YouTube and I typed in Ocarina, and it's as if that's like the most definitive source. In some sense, it kind of is. And came up this like these videos from Doc Jazz, who's this online Ocarina tutor. He teaches people how to play Ocarina. And his most popular videos were had two or four million views, and they were like, Zelda, Legend of Zelda. So I was like, ah, yes. If people know Zelda, then maybe they know Ocarina because there was that game, Legend of Zelda, the Ocarina of Time, commonly regarded as one of the best games ever made. Yeah. <laughs> nice. So, uh, so after that, we just started making the thing. one or two videos we made. The other was the Stairway to Heaven video, in which we're obviously trying to reach a slightly different demographic um, with that. Um, and uh, let's see if I can play something else here. Um, we actually heard the laptop orchestra version of this, but. you as you play and uh, you can kind of just hang out here and whenever you're ready and notice that I'm kind of tilting this and that's of course trying to engage the accelerometer differently throughout the the note so game of sorts, it's Ocarina 2, um, but it's kind of a game where it doesn't, like, I guess part of the design is that we didn't want to make people feel like they were pushed into it. And so this is kind of one of those things where you kind of just play it at your own pace and let you discover the music. At the end of the day, you know, if I were to give like a really rough definition of what, uh, basically what uh, the one thing the instrument has to be is that the potential to be expressive. And if we can kind of bring that expressiveness and maybe a little bit of joy of making music to people that play these apps, that's, that seems like a really cool start. Um, so uh, that's part of the ocarina. And I think what we were hearing is actually the other part of the ocarina, which is the globe. Um, and, uh, and this is also came out of this question of like, how can we take advantage of everything that's on the iPhone, or at least as much as we can? And, and part of that is using GPS and the fact that your iPhone is often just connected to the network. So we added this feature where you can actually listen in on uh, other people playing Ocarina around the world. So let me see if I can get that going. Hold on, let me log in into the Wi-Fi here. Let 
me switch devices here. minimal piece of music. Uh, Navi or Navi from maybe Paris. Dragon Breath from Chicago. And you, you, you can kind of So this is kind of a, to date, like people have actually, Zelda is always a popular tune on the globe. So that's the social feature to, to Ocarina. And that was, you know, it's a pretty simple feature. It actually took, I mean, that feature really literally just means we capture the gesture, the accelerometer data, the uh, multi-touch data, the breath envelope, and we basically put that into a neat, compact uh, little binary file. We send that up to the server, and we just store these with a location. And then we're actually hearing are just the server kind of picking out which stream to listen to, and it sends you down just gesture data and gets re-rendered on the globe using the same audio engine that makes the ocarina sound. Um, so that's a little bit of the social feature, and then um, people really took to YouTube, kind of to the streets in a different way, I suppose, and started making videos and performing for the world. And this was super shocking, pleasantly so to us, um, in that, wow, these people, they, they, they're actually they're performing for their friends, for the world, for whoever sees these videos. And that's pretty cool, including Lindsay here. This is why I love the iPhone. So she's a winner in the uh, Smule this, con this Contest Blows Ocarina video contest. And uh, um, of course, she's, you know, she, apparently she's been a nose flautist like all her life, she says. And this is just her most recent nose flute. So um, we send her and all the other winners like a $1,000 Smule shirt. But for her, we also send her a box of Kleenex for her troubles. Um, and then you see comments like this on YouTube, and which is like, you know, I don't, we don't even really know where to begin. And um, I'll just let you read that. Um, and I think earlier I had a slide that I kind of went, glanced over and said, you know, there's, there's a notion actually back from the old ubiquitous computing days that technology should create calm. This notion of calm technology, and that can be taken in a lot of different ways. One of which is technology should not be in the foreground of our lives. You know, this is, this, this is uh, something that was championed by Mark Weiser and others at, at actually Xerox Park when they're working on ubiquitous computing about 20 years ago. And they thought, wouldn't it be nice if computers were powerful but also were invisible? They were all around us were pervasive. At the same time, they, they, they didn't really require us to really mind them or to really even be aware that they're there. Um, but I guess this is a different calm. Um, and this maybe more has to do with, you know, there's an opportunity to uh, do something that engages aesthetically or emotionally, viscerally. Um, and after, I guess seeing comments like this, we're like, whoa, you know, that's, that's pretty deep. That's pretty cool, and uh, it's you know very humbling that you know we never thought that this would 
something like this would be, be happening. And then you get other stuff like this. This uh, Before Ocarina, we actually had another app called the Sonic of Lighter. And I don't have time to show you that today, but it had the same GPS features in there where when you, it's a thick lighter that you kind of just like, you basically just start. Um, and also records the location when you do that. And so this blog was in Sonic Lighter map and then saw that there was like, you know, the wonder of that circle up there was the location of the northernmost recorded iPhone user at the time. And it's somewhere where, it's a place where someone apparently lit up their sonic lighter. And we looked at this location, uh, on, there was actually no visible landmass there. So we wonder, is that like a, like an oil platform? Is that like, they've had a net network, right? I mean, for a while we thought, man, is that like a call for help, a distress signal? But if you have your iPhone, you have network, because you need it for here. There's GPS on this. There must be better ways to call for help than with your fake virtual lighter. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and then there's uh, another one of these unintended, I think, artifacts that came out of this is uh, zooming into the sonic lighter ignition map in late 2008 in the Pasadena, California area. We saw this pattern emerge where someone was trying to tell us something. And uh, I think the easiest way to do this is probably just walk down the street and every few steps you light the lighter and blow it out. And, uh, and you can see the length of the football stadium over there. And this is actually someone really had some a lot of time that day. <laughs> um, and another aspect of this was an experiment we tried after Ocarina, and that's leaf trombone. This is another social experiment. Um, and the leaf trombone is kind of like Ocarina, but like Ocarina 2 eventually is kind of this thing that gives you hints as to how to play a particular song but you didn't have to follow those, um, and you weren't really scored. And, but thinking about how to really give people feedback and how they're playing was where we came up with this, you know, the question is like, how, people want feedback, how do we give it to them? Like how well are they playing Yellow Submarine on the leaf trombone, for example? Um, and uh, that's when thinking like another part of actually com computation and uh, computer science is this idea of, you know, of human computation. Uh, you know, one central tenet of which is that certain tasks are just inherently difficult computers, but easy for humans. You know, we encounter this actually, you know, pretty regularly through various things like CAPTCHA. You know, these are supposed to be easy for people, hard for computers. Though, I don't know about you guys, for me, CAPTCHAs lately have become difficult for me. Um, but this is another, this don't always have to be like, you know, kind of these scrambled words make it really hard for computer vision to kind of figure out what is actually there. But like this, you know, please prove you're more than a mindless spam bot by identifying who gets the beer. Um, that's a CAPTCHA. And of course, things like the uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk, where you can do these uh, human intelligence tasks um, to actually, you know, it's kind of this micro economy where you can set up tasks and other people do them and you know they call it artificial artificial intelligence because it's really people powered um, but at the same time you're using technology simply to harness the computational power that's in the brains of, of humans um, so we thought hey why don't we do that and make leaf trombone this like crowdsource platform for a musical critique so basically in leaf trombone, what you would do is you would, someone would compose a, a particular song or a piece for the leaf trombone. That gets made available to all the users, and the users perform a particular piece. For example, you know, all in design. And, um, and those go into these online real-time collaborative judging sessions, where judges in real time to each other are listening, giving feedback on what they're hearing. And they're actually getting rewarded and leveling up as judges, while performers are leveling up in this game as, as performers. And at the end, they kind of give each other score. And um, you kind of do this three at a time, and that completes this feedback loop that we're going after. They, could, they also use a set of emoticons to indicate at any given time they're kind of the closest thing to how they're feeling. Everything ranging from, you know, that's funny, to I'm falling asleep, to, you know, I'm rocking out in the middle, I guess. Um, and these are, of course, you know, animated. And at the end, you give them kind of a score between 1 to 10 and you know, more comment. This is all time tag recorded. And the, the performer can go back and view this. 
Um, to date, you know, beef trombone is actually no longer an active product. It's a rather old product that we shelved, but you know, during its time, it had 6,000 user-generated songs, um, 700,000 performances judged, and that's three judges per, per, per session. It had nearly a million users, and the most judged and played songs on the leaf trombone included the following. Um, and the other point about this is that you know, once you put a system that, you know, that has these gaming aspects in place, people are amazingly willing to spend time doing stuff. So the most prolific composer has uh, put out 177 songs. We did not pay them a, anything. Most prolific performer performed 2,600 times. That's like a three minute performance each time. The most prolific judge judged 10,000 sessions. Who are these people? And, and uh, what do they do? What do they do? It might be the same guy that's like walking around spelling letters in Pasadena. But uh, of course, this is one end of this, this distribution. Um, so that's the leave trombone. That's another experiment. And uh, you know, then there's the Stanford Mobile Phone Orchestra, which abbreviates to MOFO with a PH. Um, and we actually wear these speaker gloves. And this is kind of a very mobile version of the salad bowl speakers in that these will help you amplify the sound mobile device, but we cut off the fingertips off of these gloves so that you, know, you can manipulate touch screens on mobile devices. These are actually sewn on by hand um, to the back of these like, you know, these speakers. All of this you can get off of Amazon or somewhere online. Um, and we've been giving performances that are both like more traditional, but also some are very geographically and even temporally disjoint. Um, uh, and uh, by way of creating more kind of instruments and thinking about this and thinking about how we can bring more this idea of expression and just the fun of playing music to a wide audience, we created things like Magic Piano and Magic Fiddle. And the Magic Fiddle is something that really was like, was done because of like a bad bet. Um, walking out of the San Francisco Symphony performance with Long Long, um, who was performing on his iPad, and I commented to, uh, to some friends and think, man, wouldn't it be funny if there's an iPad app like for a violin that forced you to put your chin on it to play it? Wouldn't you look ridiculous? And a few months later, we had the magic fiddle. Um, and I'll just play a little bit for you here. And I'm gonna, I mean, magic fiddle wasn't, wasn't really created to emulate the fiddle so much as it was just to emulate the nostalgia of learning a fiddle or instrument or having a neighbor who's learning <laughs> the violin. Um, so. so this controls the dynamics. So uh, I mean, it's there's you can as bad as it sounds, it could always sound worse. Um, so that that's the magic fiddle. It came came with a um, a storybook that has eight chapters of teaching you of instructions of teaching you how to play the magic fiddle, including starting with you know how you should actually position this, how you should hold it. I even had a mode actually here, which originally I, f I, I had it so you had to put your chin on this. Um, and you kind of see this thing reacting. But I also found that um, not all chins will activate the touch screen. <laughs> like some said I should just shave, and I did, and it still didn't work. So my chin doesn't really do it. But other people's chin will consistently activate this. So, that was the reason why it's otherwise, it would, you know, it was totally going to go in as the feature. So uh, there's that. And uh, let me show you a Magic Piano video. Um,
express these notes are kind of up to you. And uh, I have no idea what I'm doing there, but I'm just trying to say it's actually this is the, the foothills behind the Stanford. I should rent it like a slow motion camera to make this. And, uh, yeah. Just to completely lower your expectation, I'm just gonna let this finish. Okay, continuing on, um, just a few more things to show you, and um, oh, that's the St. Lawrence String Quartet, um, trying out the uh, Magic Fiddle. Um, it's June and I playing a duet, and uh, there's a quote I wanna just also throw out there, and I think it's very relevant to these computers, and that's, the most profound technologies are those that disappear. They weave themselves into the fabric of everyday life until they're indistinguishable from it. Um, and if you think about kind of these mobile phones, that's kind of what they're starting to do. And we kind of took this somewhat literally and actually created an uh, instrument. This is created by actually Nick Krug, which Smule later published. Nick was a master student at Karma and actually started this app while, um, while a student in my mobile music class, and then he really took it the distance. Um, so MadPad is an instrument, well, it's kind of a meta instrument that allows you to make instruments out of sa sounds and images from your, your surroundings in your daily life. So here's an example. Just bad puns everywhere. <laughs> Created instruments out of um, everything from you know kind of actual like you know traditional instruments to just banging on things to sound of money to the sound of food being things being cooked there are pets uh, you name it so there's there's also like um, it, there's it's something that's also meant to be shared um, so when you create a map pad set and you can share and you can also browse for those around you that have created this. And then there's T-Pain. Um, we worked with T-Pain to, to bring, for better or for worse, auto-tune to the iPhone back in 2009. Um, now it's called the T-Pain effect, but it's, it's a pitch detection and correction. And of course, it's that T-Pain sound. And uh, I seem to have set myself on a path of total self-humiliation, so I'm gonna continue that and uh, show you this. with a song, or part of a song. Check, 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 check. check. Oh yeah, I'm gonna actually put it through this. Shut a snake, T-Pain. Damn, shut a snake. Shut a Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, she slammed. La la ooh. Yeah, snap your fingers. Please stay. You can do it all by yourself. Baby girl, what's your name? Let me talk to you. Buy you a drink. I'm T-Pain. You know me. Convict music now before the week. Know the club, close at three. What's the chance of you going with me? Back to the crib, show you how I live. Let's get.
the trunk But here we take Buy you a drink Whoa That's a TV Yeah, that's a TV Yeah, that's a TV Yeah, that's a TV Yeah, that's a TV He sings about a lot of different serious subject matters in most of which involves either getting drunk there's a song called I'm in love with a stripper and uh, but he's like a really cool a really cool dude and um, and when we actually talked to him about building a T-Pain app um, you know T-Pain was like yeah auto tune auto tune the iPhone and it was you know it's kind of kind of his uh, it was in many ways his vision for kind of how this app is supposed to go and uh, so Further force, you know, there's there's IMT pain, and then um, maybe related to this is uh, is a more recent app called Auto Rap, and I'll just demo this with another video. If you thought the piano one was bad, this one is uh, this one may be even worse. It's called the Cornholio test, so that should already be. Swap audio here real quick. Here we're going to put autorap through a process known as the Cornholio test. The idea is that if we can autorap this, we can autorap just about anything. Let's go to it. So basically turn speech into I am or the almighty bunghole My bunghole it speaketh it says ticket ta ka 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 Let's auto wrap this. So this is the result. I am the Almighty Bamboyo. I am the Almighty Bamboyo. I am the Almighty Bamboyo. My bumbler is speaking that it's just a ticket that got the get 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 So that was actually the output of that one take and with actually absolutely no additional, you know, tweaking or doctoring, that's actually the output. And the person crawling behind me was actually trying to avoid the camera. He thought he could, but yeah. So that's Auto Rob, and this is actually created by the Kush team at Smule. We, uh, Kush, Kush joined the Smule family um, as a company in uh, late last year, and they've been creating really wonderful audio technology. It started with Lottie Da, which is reverse karaoke. You basically sing a melody, and then it'll intelligently put a backing track in a certain style under you. Um, then Songify, speech and song, and you know, then there's Auto Rap. Um, so let's go back here. So, um, and if we're to look back and think about the to the beginning, kind of what we're trying to do with this, and a, a part of that is just you know just to get people to really just under, just to really feel that music is just a lot of fun, Bef you know, bef really before anything else, and especially for people who might otherwise not play an instrument or not play music. In some ways, these people are you know, with T-Pain actually in this case, have really taken to the streets. And uh, I was gonna show you one more video here. And uh, this is the lyrics from this, this user produced video, which is a parody of I'm on a boat, which is self kind of a parody, but. Um, and uh, so there's uh, actually a, a fair amount of swearing in here. So uh, um, here we go. 
Dude, the new BBM is sick. Dude, I am T Pain. the idea. So uh, for better or for worse, you know, this is the generation that are you know, part of the generation that is uh, growing up used with mobile technology kind of entrenched already in their daily lives. And uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see where, where things go. I do want to leave you with one last thing. And, uh, and this is thinking about more about the social dimension of all of this. Um, and in that, I, I think, you know, building instruments for these things is it's, it's definitely like probably good to ask why, and I'm not sure if we have the answer to that, but you know, to the extent that we do it, you know, I think we've been f trying to do it in a way that's expressive, that whatever we make can afford some type of musical expression. And if even it has gaming elements, and just because it's gaming elements and it doesn't mean it can't be expressive. The other is that simply making ports or facsimiles of instruments on here I don't really see the point in that as much. And, and at the end of the day, if you really want a, a great piano or a great cello, you should go learn the piano or play the cello. This is not, you're never, you know, these are not, you know, you're, these can only be worse, potentially much worse. But if you can do something here that you potentially can't really do on a traditional instrument, then, it, then I think it's interesting from a research point of view. For example, if you can get Ocarina users to listen to each other, like other people play this instrument, there's something potentially interesting in that. It's kind of maybe one of the first instruments that kind of allows its users to casually listen in in a kind of voyeuristic way into other people. Okay, so that, that's, maybe that gives us more of a reason to, to try things. Um, and. And the other is like, can we bring more people to start making music and understanding just how fun and awesome, how much it rocks to, to play music. Because we've become a very you know, consumer oriented people. And ironically, it's really technology that kind of took us as a civilization from, I think a very, you know, we, apparently there's a time when families would like play music together as, you know, as, a, as entertainment and to, consume music 100 years ago, you kind of had to play it or be around someone that plays it. So people didn't think very hard about making, you know, making music or learning an instrument. And, you know, the, uh, the, words, the word amateur actually used to mean something quite good. It meant someone who, you know, you're learning an instrument. Now we think amateur is like not professional, but there's a time when, when there were a lot of amateurs in the really great sense of the word to play music. And then technology came in in court of media and in radio and television and made it so easy for us to consume things like music that and perhaps took away some of the impetus for making it and to make it almost seem so hard to, to make it now, you know, I mean, children don't really have this problem. They, they seem to have very little inhibition of doing just about anything. For some reason, as we grow up, we seem to develop inhibitions of saying, well, I'm not an artist, I'm not a musician, I'm not this, I'm not that. I'm, you, know, you become very specific to what you do. I don't see why it has to be that way. It didn't used to be that way. Um, and I can't think of any actual reason to actually have this external, to, to cave in essentially to this external social pressure perhaps. 
So it's good to find ways to try to stave that off. Um, and, uh, and now I feel like technology is at a point where we actually have a chance to use the same, to use technology again to turn things around, to get more people to make music and also to make music in ways that we previously couldn't. Um, so back to this example. In the wake of the 2011 um, earthquake and tsunami disasters in Japan, a woman uh, started a rendition of Lean On Me in, in, uh, in the Glee app. And this is an app we did with Fox Digital Entertainment based on the television show Glee, uh, which is all about singing. And in this, we had a feature where you could actually add your voice to any other song that someone has already performed on the globe. So she said, hey, join me and sing Lean On Me. And so people did. And then it started to snowball to the point where something like four or 5,000, there's actually a rendition of Lean On Me that has 5,000 people on it. And in this visualization, actually it's in the app, you can kind of see all these points of, you know, kind of all of these uh, performances converging on Japan, which is at one end of this, and the other end just that can kind of uh, come from all around the world. And these are strangers kind of coming together and making music. And you know, there's certainly curiosity that that I have, wondering, you know, what kind of new musical instruments can we make? Isn't just, you know, certainly we want to find ways of um, re envisioning certain traditional instruments, and maybe some we should just leave the freaking heck alone. Um, and uh, I think. But on the other case is that can we actually make truly new instruments um, that can we get a million people to contribute meaningfully to a piece of music in creating it, composing it, and making it, and rendering it? Um, I don't know, but I feel like the stage is set. Now, this is not a new instrument. This is just kind of almost as just an, um, something that happened. Uh, let me see if I can have an audio clip of it here. These are faces. So I guess in, in this case, I just want to end by saying, you know, when, if the hope is that when someone listens to one to this, or if they listen to just the little ditty that someone's playing on the ocarina, I'm hoping that the first thing that is going through their mind isn't, wow, the technology is pretty cool, or like, this is a cool product or whatever. I think it should just be a very simple, well, hopefully visceral reaction that, wow, there's, there's other people out there somewhere. And then through this music, there's, they feel just a little bit more of the sense of connection. And I think there is a lot of potential in the social dimension here for using, combining music, technology, and people to uh, just to kind of, to, to get back almost to a more tribal versions of ourselves in some sense. Um, so with that, I'll, uh, I'll stop talking and see if any questions. It was uh, so in the app you have an option to turn on pitch correction uh -huh. Uh -huh. or to leave it off. And so actually if you hear that it was kind of this you know some people were actually pitch corrected and some people weren't. And so the, if you have a lot of people who are essentially auto-tuned together, it actually doesn't sound that great. It's like, sounds like it's hollow, like, you know, kind of everyone has this perfect intonation. And um, to be honest, we had no idea that that would actually even work. The system wasn't built to support like a thousand voices. It was built to support like five or six, like you and some maybe your friends. Um, but uh, it ended up working and, uh, 
um, at least as well as you know as you heard. And now there's like thousands. All right. Yeah. Oh, it's just funny. Did everybody sing in English or? Um, I think what the audio we heard is what people saying with their phone, and so conceivably some people may have saying in, in other languages. Um, is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah I, I think I think everyone was. Is, I mean, it's a it's kind of part of it's just karaoke, so it has the words and everything on there, as well as kind of the pitch you're supposed to be seeing as a visual indicator. And then, but whatever people want to sing into this, some people could just even talk or conceivably even, you know sing something entirely different. So it's up to you. What we're hearing is kind of a mix where um, any single voice isn't really that, you know, that prominent. And to be honest, it seems like, I mean, well, they say, you know, birds are, you know, counting-wise, they, they kind of have this concept of one, two, or many. Um, beyond, like, two things, they just think of as many. Beyond, I don't know, maybe like 30 to 100 voices, it, kind of just sounds like a lot of people. Um, and uh, the 1,000 version and the 3,000 people version uh, sounds kind of similar. <laughs> so, um, and part of it may have to do with its limitation of, you know, kind of the technology we have in here and in terms of, I mean, also our human perception system and just how we can actually, you know, how much dynamic range we can actually perceive. And so, uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting, uh, it's been an interesting ride trying to figure that out. I just wondered if your grandparents and parents are still alive to see what's become of their experiment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're, well, I have to say, uh, uh, my mom, I think, finally knows what I'm doing, you know, like, after many years, and, and, uh, and my, my grandfather passed away in 2008, when, when Smil was started, but he, um, I think he got the sense of onto something really crazy and wacky, and that I think that fit him very much. I went back to Beijing this summer, and where I found my old guitar, but I found it with this um, this like sawed-off ruler um, at at the uh, at the nut and at the tuning end of the guitar, and that raised the string about you know two thirds of an inch up. And uh, I looked at this, and I'm just like, whoa. This, I don't know when this happened. My grandfather must have done this some years back to convert this into like a slide guitar, because um, he played slide guitar, and uh, and that's kind of like that's kind of like my dad, like you know, kind of like fixing the stereo to make it into a guitar amp. Uh, looking at that was like you know, it's like yeah, it's, it's, that's my grandfather, right? And uh, and my grandma, I think she has an idea. Of, you know, she she actually emails with my dad now pretty regularly on her iPad. She's never used a computer, and she's ninety. Five this year, um, yeah. So yeah, they seem to. I feel very fortunate. Last question. What's next? Oh, good, good question. I don't really know. It depends. Probably um, there's always some new things cooking up, but I think it's this idea of exploring the social dimension a lot more. I mean, really interested in thinking about how we can use what we know about how we make music currently and trying to extend that in ways that we can maybe do that in meaningful ways kind of across well, across the world but also thinking of can we make instruments that are that we've never even that we don't even think of don't even know today and and have a lot of people or different people kind of make music in a different way um, and a lot of this has to do with I think uh, with who we make music with. You know, there are, music is this wonderful, like, it's like the best icebreaker sometimes. If, if, you know, I mean, if you really meet someone, I mean, you don't exchange that many, much meaningful information. It's like, nice weather, my name is such and such, this is what I do. But when you play music with someone, that's like, that's, that's a very true bond that, you know, you don't even need to say anything else. And it, does, it doesn't matter how well you make the music necessarily, but just the act of trying to connect through making music, that's like, that's pretty cool. And so, you know, it's just, I think making music with your friends is one. Making music with total strangers, I think could be quite interesting. And especially now we have this global positioning possibility. And also there are people who are in the middle who you might refer to as like, familiar strangers, 
These people share the same location and time. It's like the same people who take the train with you into the city to work every day. You see the same cats kind of on the train, but you never talk to them. And if you don't talk to them for two years, you're probably never going to talk to them. But being in, in the same location, can we use mob mobile software, musical things to get them to at least interact together? They still don't have to talk to each other. That's not the goal, but they, because they share the time and place, there might be some interesting musical interactions that I'm sure there can be interesting musical interactions that can arise out of that. So, um, so really thinking about like not just what we do with music, but who we really, who people make music with, uh, it's just one of I think many really interesting quest, uh, questions out there. And I, I think the time has never been better just for us all to just explore what what is now possible. It's it's making an app on the iPhone is it's not easy to be sure but it's like a lot easier than I mean there's the same spirit that exists now as there did maybe like back in really kind of the garage programming days of like when you know it, and I hope it doesn't really leave that you know kind of this it's kind of now it's like I think it's wonderful that it really doesn't feel that hard to make an app and it, the truth of it it kind of isn't um, so you know Hope more music apps come out there. All right, now, before I let you go, I just want to thank first Shona Whitecloud, David Berger, and Victoria Smith for make everything that can happen. I want to thank Bill for coming, and I want to thank the one right now. Thank you.